Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the main track of Logisim Asia Pacific 2023. So we have a big room to fill now. So uh, for those on the freight track earlier, uh, plenty of sitting room. So uh, feel free to come in and make yourself comfortable. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Steph. So always much appreciated the help. So, <laughs> so we'll get on with the session. Uh, this is the home stretch for Logisim 2023. Asia Pacific. It's been fantastic so far. We're, the, the two tracks we had this morning on freight and coal chain, I think, were very, very uh, informative. And yesterday also with the digitalization and inter-logistics track, uh, we've heard some fantastic presentations and, and panels. This afternoon, we'll, we'll wrap up with some uh, very interesting topics, uh, and then we'll finish off with the, the chairman's address. So first up is this presentation on maritime decarbonisation, the what, the where and the how. This is where we want to reduce our carbon emissions uh, in the maritime industry. It can be a sensitive topic, it can be an emotional topic, uh, but there are some facts and figures that also go along with it. So to present on this, I'd like to welcome Mr Wolfgang Lemarca to the stage. I think for those yesterday or who are here, uh, I don't need to introduce Wolfgang but is the operating partner of Anchor Group out of Hong Kong. Uh, he's a very experienced gentleman. And without any further ado, Wolfgang, the stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Just looking for the remote. life it's not recorded um, yeah this is a topic of my passion and uh, yeah we have a lot of young people in the room and uh, I think they have a, a big interest that we tackle uh, what I will talk about so for every 0.1 percent uh, increase in temperature above current level we expose 140 million people to extreme weather. So this is just some numbers. Uh, we have over, let's say more than 100 years, increased the level in average by 0.14%. So in recent years that doubled, so we are at 0.3. And uh, we all know that the Paris Accord um, foresees or had as the objective to limit the uh, increase to below 1.5% uh, currently, and there is a study out that we are on a trajectory of 2.7. So 1.5 would mean that 5% of the global population is exposed to existential risk. If we go to 2.7, then we're talking about 22% of the global population, which is one-fourth, and we're talking of the, the year is 2,100, it's far out, but uh, we will then have 10, 10 billion people on the planet. That would mean <laughs> quite over above uh, north of 2 billion people exposed to extreme risk. If we go to a bit more extreme scenario, which is 3.6, uh, which is currently seen as the worst case, but it's a very dynamic topic, so every year scientists are more worried because things go faster than expected. Um, so then we would have half of the world's population exposed to extreme heat and existential risk. So that is to, to put the thing into context. And as Scott said, there, is, there are controversial views. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, I think that the side of those people who think that it's not man-made is uh, declining, in decline, and there is, a, I think, now a mainstream strong view that uh, it is man-made and uh, we should do something about this. And transport is a big contributor. Uh, I saw a number yesterday, I, I found it's a bit at the higher, higher end of the spectrum, uh, but uh, um, we have to, to contribute as a sector, logistics, transport, supply chain, uh, 
to, re to the reduction. And the, the problem with transportation is that our emissions are growing and other sectors manage to decline. So in fact, our contribution, every moment we wait, needs to be bigger if we want to achieve the set targets. Uh, so this is a bit of the introduction to, to put the, the topic into perspective and why I uh, work on this. So I, I have picked that topic because uh, I, I'm passionate about it and I think it needs to be done. Uh, last year, we gathered 67 experts uh, after a call from Risto Pantile, who is the CEO of, of a think tank, uh, the Nordic West office, uh, who, who asked me whether I would be willing to contribute to a study. So we, I said yes, and I got Michael Lind, uh, the first professor for maritime informatics, also uh, passionate about the topic, and the two of us started to, to document and, and drive a lot of, of things. And uh, we published uh, a playbook, a playbook, practical playbook for decarbonization. This is freely available on the internet, so I, I recommend everyone to, to download that who is interested in the topic. After this, we published five articles in the Maritime Executive uh, where we discussed and further elaborated together with some of the experts on, on specific areas of the topic. And then uh, we decided uh, to write a book about it. And uh, again, we have around 60, 60 to 70 experts uh, who together with us put this book together. Uh, and. Uh, the book will be, this will be called Maritime Decarbonization, uh, as the title of this, this session. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of other things we, we did, but uh, um, currently the main focus is on uh, the book. Um, here is uh, the overview of the companies, the brands that had been involved um, in the playbook. And uh, I think almost everyone also participated somehow in the book. Um, so the book should contribute to the discourse as much as this talk here, so that people get more aware of uh, uh, what can be done in the, in the maritime sector. And this is um, the overview of, of what we did so far. Um, this were, these are 17 interviews with uh, high-ranked executives and experts in international organizations, in, uh, in companies, uh, at ports, etc. Uh, we did four workshops. We uh, were then uh, um, writing three scenarios. I will explain a little bit more about this. We identified 37 enablers, and I see them today as enabler groups, uh, which indicates already there's a lot we can do now. And then uh, we, have some, uh, we have some other topics. They gave re uh, recommendations. Um, and these recommendations are listed here. So the recommendation is that every, every organization that is interested in, in working on reducing the carbon emission uh, starts the exercise with a discussion. How will the future look like? The future around us, our future. So, so what will determine us? The second is that we need targets. And, and current targets um, are under discussion, uh, especially in the, in the maritime sector, which, by the way, maritime transport was excluded from the Paris Agreement. Aviation was excluded from the Paris Agreement. So we are about to correct that and align uh, industry um, agreements and targets with the Paris Agreement. So then we need to think about value chains. I will explain briefly why. Um, we, will, we need to, everyone needs to understand what can I do? What are the drivers, the levers, the enablers which allow us as a company to reduce emissions? And uh, 
Uh, we have heard about different scopes of emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, and scope three is, is probably uh, where our, uh, as industry, as transport industry, our customers ask us to help to reduce their, their scope three emission. And there is, in the, in the meantime, also scope four, which is, in fact, the avoidance of emissions. So, but there is a lot you can do. And then there is... Uh, there is the, the point that you cannot do these things alone. So once you have worked yourself through scenarios, you put yourself uh, a target, you work through your value chains, you see where the enablers are, you will see, oh, I can't do this alone. Because we are working in a decarbonization, or at the moment more in a carbonization system of interrelated and interdependent value chains. That means we need to decarbonize, collaborate it in a way we have never collaborated before. And then we have to think about mechanisms because we are driven by markets. So that's the famous market-based mechanisms. We have to think how do we deal with, how do we align and leverage the market forces to drive decarbonization. And then, yes, we should start now. If you think that the average lifetime of a vessel is 30 years and we want to reduce by half, that's the previous ambition, which is currently under discussion whether this is enough. And many say it should be zero emission. So if we are in 2023, a vessel has an average age of 30 years and we want to reach half uh, a target of that magnitude, we have to change the fleet very quickly. <laughs> so what, what we came up with after the 17 interviews, the four workshops, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, is a four-layered model or framework um, which you can use. And uh, it is, no surprise, the scenarios, the value chain, the enablers, the partnerships, and that allow you to drive action. So what were the, the scenarios? And this is something which is always, always like uh, raising the awareness. So you talk to, speak to people and say, we give you th the choice between three worlds. You have a capitalist, market-driven, wealth-first world. You have a world which is a world of me first, which is global fragmentation, decoupling, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we call the first swells, and I can tell you why, because this is, this is a wave which builds up very, very slowly, but continuously before it then, at the end, quickly moves up and breaks. So that that is the scenario, and the idea here is that, yeah, as we are looking at money first, we try to push the, the investments down the road, kick the can down the road, and uh, it's getting worse and worse and worse, and suddenly we can't not, and then we mobilize trillions of dollars to fix the problem. So the second scenario is fragmentation, uh, which is in fact the worst, which we found out after all this discussion, because we have a very fragmented uh, fuel landscape, we have a very fragmented uh, infrastructure uh, landscape, we have a very fragmented regulatory landscape, so everybody does what he wants or she wants or it wants, and we are a global industry, as we all know. So. You have to take off with methanol fuel and you have to land with hydrogen, right? I'm exaggerating, but that's kind of the situation uh, where, you, where you will have tremendous overcost to deal with, with, with that and uh, the, di the diverse situation. So you need a diverse answer. I can say one of the, of the key findings after having discussed that with so many experts is we need a very flexible solution because we shouldn't dream. The world will be diverse and fragmented to a certain stage, but 
definitely that scenario is not helping. The last scenario is the scenario where we act now, where we align regulation, where we work on technology, and not only on low carbon, but also no carbon, where we look at all levers, and uh, yeah, we will then probably land somewhere between 1.5 and 2.7 if we do that at the, at, the, at the economy level. So when we spoke, Michael and I, with all the experts, we asked, where do you want to go? Yeah, and they all say, we want to go on the, on the clear sky scenario. And, then, and where are we going now? Yeah, we are going uh, a bit to swells. Um, and we have some risk with fragmentation. And it always came down when you talk to the business people to the business model. So we have, unfortunately, pressures. And it should not cost too much, Wolfgang. If we go to the clean sky, we have to really change the whole uh, environment. And surprisingly, a lot of executives said, yeah, maybe the regulator can help. And the governments can tell us where we have to, to go. Then everybody has to go there. And then we speak to the government, and the government never, ever. We have no idea about technology. We have no idea about fuels. So how can we prescribe something we don't know? So that's a bit the dilemma where we stand. And uh, what, what is the conclusion there? We, we start with swells. So we have pioneers. We have Maersk. We have Maersk ordering 11 ships, e-methanol ships, but with dual fuel engines. So there's very low risk because they still can run on fossil fuel, right? But they're doing it. And months later, almost a year later, CMA, uh, uh, CGM, CMA, uh, CMA CGM also ordered uh, dual fuel ships. So that's what we need, and we need it faster, right? But that is where we're currently going. The European regulator is pushing very hard to accelerate and support the process and to move the needle towards the clear sky scenario. Uh, and then we have the problem of the decoupling, which we have to deal with. But uh, I, I took a little bit more time here to explain why it is so important to understand the circumstance, because that, that gives you an understanding of what is the beast we are dealing with. And for example, if governments decouple, industry can still collaborate. So we as an industry have the possibility to build bridges. Right? We don't need to follow the government in, in the tensions. Right? So we can have agreements about what fuel what bunker infrastructure uh, should be developed. And uh, there is, a, I think, much more conversation and exchange in the industry as there was before. So here are, here's a bit more background on the, on the different scenarios. So everybody who has now taken the picture sees what SWELL is about and who we're going to blame, right? And SWELL, we blame the regulator, or the regulator blames the, the business, and the business will blame the regulator. Uh, in storms, we will definitely blame other countries, right? It's me first, uh, and the others should have done something, and then we have clear sky, where when something happened, we say we have to try even harder. So the logic of these three scenarios are very different, and those who are influential big companies, they should also then use this scenario and discuss with their governments uh, and maybe create a little bit of a, a more, um, let's say, cooperative approach in some countries. Some countries in the world are still hyper-cooperative, but we know we're living in a world which is more towards fragmentation. So what we did in the playbook, and you will see this, so we, we looked how, what would be the enablers which can be activated, will be activated in those different scenarios over the different decades. So what will probably happen in 2020, the 2020s, and the 2030s, and then in the 2040s, and where will we end? 
also this. So in Svelte, we will end. Yeah, we still use fossil fuels because it was a bit late, 30 years of lifetime, right? We, we waited too long. But with all the money and, and all the, the, because this is a strong scenario with all the economic power we have, with all the entrepreneurial power of companies, we manage at least to uh, reduce the damage. Uh, in the second scenario, we're just stuck, right? So fossil fuel will be dominant because we have fragmented the world to a stage that there is no hope in hell that we can come to a global decarbonization accord and solution. And of course, in the, in the clear sky, it's all not all clear and beautiful. We still have fossil fuel, but we have past the peak and we are on a good track and probably the least amount of people will be exposed to existential risk in this scenario. So a little bit about uh, the value chains. What also became very clear is this is not doable by shipping alone. So because emissions are created by fuel, if there is no fuel, so must CMA, CGM, they buy the ship, but if there's no, sh no fuel, and currently the, the, the entire global production of green, of green methanol doesn't suffice to fill the fleet of Maersk, the order book. So which means that we have to push the energy sector to, do, to contribute their part and drive this. The energy sector, this is not on the slide, needs innovators because it requires new technology, either private innovators or uh, academic innovators or research institute to do the job. So that explains why partnerships are so important. And then ships. Ships are the ship construction, the ship building is very energy intense, <coughs> in particular steel. So we need green steel. So you need to help there. So, and then if you, if you think, okay, it's like an electric car. You, many think, okay, you, you take a normal car, you put an electric motor in it, and then that's it. No, it's a completely new car. So the future green ships have to be designed in a very different way. Different energy density, etc. cetera. Um, so you have this, you need to think in a, decarbonization ecosystem. You cannot think in an industry perspective anymore. So, and then in these value chains are sitting the, en the enablers. And some enablers, we see, they prove me wrong, some <laughs> enablers you can activate alone, but with, but with others you need one other value chain or even two other value chains. And I explained already there's more than three value chains, but these are the three core value chain in the maritime decarbonization ecosystem. And this is maritime, and here are not only maritime people. So if you're in aviation, you have to do the same thing, right? If you're in other industry, in trucking, you have to do the same thing and think this through in a structured way. So here, just uh, to point you to the, the right page, in the report, you have an overview of the enablers. And if you go through them, you have some which, which really you, you say we can work on this immediately, calculation of emissions. This is a science, but we can work on this. Right? What, is, what else? Uh, contracts. Sounds very easy, but in, in maritime, the overhaul of the contractual architecture will probably take 20 years. So this is one of the oldest industry uh, that exists, and so we need to change the way we contract. I, I could do a two-hour presentation on this topic alone. So you can, you can put in, in every vessel a dual fuel engine. Who stops us to do that, right? So this can be done tomorrow with every new build, right? You can change the hydrodynamics of ships immediately, 
right? You put the engine in, you have different hull design, so you can do this. Why don't we do it, right? So what we then did were, okay, we looked into more precisely what can be done now, what can be done within limits now, what can be done without limits. We looked at different timelines, and in the report you will find this. And then comes the, the partnership bit. Uh, in the report that falls flat, uh, we just didn't have the time, we had a delivery date, and we didn't elaborate enough on this. But if you put Lind Lehmacher, the maritime executive, and partnerships in decarbonization, you will get the maritime executive article, which elaborates more on this. And we identified a number of um, partnerships which we, we um, then positioned in this, in this matrix, which is a vertical, typical supply chain, which is horizontal amongst peers, and which is both, which is horizontal and, ver uh, uh, which is horizontal and vertical. So you have competitors and business partners working together, either on company benefits, that every company benefits, or on industry benefits. You build a hub in the Mediterranean for green fuel. It is for you, but also for others. And you have then ecosystem partnerships. Then there are some logical paths how things can evolve. If you start, everybody starts in the bottom left, right? That's what we know. We are in business, and we start there. We work with the people we know, and then we can expand to, okay, we do something for the industry, or we, we ask government to come and our competitors to come, and then we do a, something in a broader scope. This is the overview of the book, and uh, I don't want to make this the book launch presentation, so um, that's it, uh, more to come. And here are my concluding remarks. So I, I hope it became clear that decarbonization is more a mindset and needs to become a movement. I hope that we, I made clear that there are lots of enablers. I hope that it's clear that we are all responsible and we have to work together. And that uh, we need to align. And one point I haven't said is we see this very often as, fe as a fearful exercise. Oh, this is threatening us. Right? As businesses. No, it's threatening us as humanity, but as business we can make a lot of money with transforming our economy to a green economy. And therefore I think it is very logical that we start now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Wolfgang. It's, uh, I hope you can feel his passion on this topic. Uh, I certainly do. And I think if we as industry professionals can do anything to help not only uh, Wolfgang, but the rest of us and our children and our children's children, is that we need to start now. We need to start creating awareness at every level of every organisation to start helping drive this decarbonisation uh, forward not only in maritime, but across all industries. So Wolfgang, thank you very much. Um, let's get to that clear, sky, clear sky scenario. Excellent.